Yeah, yeah you could just get like one picture at some point. <laughs> just with everything. It's totally the right time. I had another one. There's this one too. Give people a minute. See if people walk down like Yes, dancing. There we are. Well, okay, but no, I'm not gonna do that. but we're pretty loud Hello. individuals, so I'm not too worried about it. We'll check it out. Um, welcome to Bibliotherapy. We're gonna basically use the next hour to kind of dig into some of the mental health aspects in the Harry Potter books, or lack thereof, spoiler alert, um, <laughs> and kind of just use the situations in Harry Potter to discuss some of the big mental health topics of today. So um, we're gonna hop in and tell you a little bit about who we are, so we're not just randos talking at you, and um, then we'll kind of go through the format and everything else. So thanks for uh, giving us the opportunity to chat with all of you guys. I'm gonna start with Miss Megan Duke. Hi, I'm Meg Duke. I'm a licensed clinical social worker supervisor and a licensed chemical dependency counselor in a number of states, not Illinois. And um, so we all know each other because uh, Hillary and I met almost 20 years ago to the day yep. at Purdue, Boiler moving in, up. Boiler up yeah. to moving into Sheely Hall. She came across to borrow some hangers, and the rest is history. <laughs> right. And um, yes, and then a, over a decade ago, I moved to Dallas, and Laura was working with my husband, and then we fell madly in love and have been together ever since. Um, and also, she has her MBA from Purdue as well. So, Boilers, all three of us. That's right. <laughs> Take me a little bit longer to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I'm Laura Browning, and just as a flat-out disclosure, I am not a mental health professional. <laughs> I'm here mostly to keep the conversation moving forward and hopefully to provide some fun color commentary, but um, we just all love Harry Potter so much, and some of the context of why we're up here today is that, you know, as friends, you become each other's unofficial therapists some of the time. They're the people that you tell everything to and the people that you take your, your biggest challenges and your greatest wins to, and so in our friend group, we use a lot of the content that we share together. We love friends in addition to Harry Potter. We're into lots and lots of different nerdy things. And some of the content that you are familiar with together can kind of guide some of those conversations. And so that's really what inspired us to start kind of talking about that and maybe using some of those things that we all do share in common to have some really important conversations. And that's what we want today to be. It's just a discussion. This is not a lecture. It's just a chat amongst friends who share this love of this thing so much and to kind of use it to talk about some, some fun and difficult things. So yeah. um, I fell in love with Harry Potter when I was in, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade and my grandma bought me the books and I went to the midnight releases and it's just yes. been an obsession ever since. So I think we can all say we're reasonably obsessed, but yes. I'll let Hillary talk, a bit, <laughs> introduce a you to herself. Um, Hillary Van Dyke, I too am not a mental health uh, specialist. That's what we have Meg in the room for. Um, but we are very much into Harry Potter, um, into critical readings of it, and really thinking through how there's lessons in that for everyone. My Harry Potter, first of all, it says Gryffindor on purpose. The first time I took the test, I was a Gryffindor, and recently became a Ravenclaw, that I'm starting to lean into that, I guess, and so I'm a Gryffindor. Um, but I started reading it as a sophomore in high school, actually, or freshman in high school when book two had come out is when I finally jumped on the bandwagon and has been highly obsessed ever since. Um, so excited to be a part of this discussion today. Awesome. And just to disclaimer, we're going to talk about some things, but we want to hear from you guys too. We're going to leave time at the end to really chat with you. So obviously we're not going to get to everything and there's definitely stuff that we missed. So think about it as we're going and we're excited to hear some feedback from you guys and to keep the conversation going because we do think this topic Harry Potter, of course, but also mental health, more importantly, is, is a very important thing for all of us. So 
Let's move on. We're going to hand it over to Meg. Wait, I'll, I would be remiss if I did not mention how I got into Harry Potter because my mama, who is sitting right there, Woo! got me the books <laughs> <laughs> when I was 14. So uh, thank you. Love you. Love you both. So I had to throw that in there. <laughs> Okay, so today we're going to, obviously, we're going to go through a little bit of um, introduction. We're going to talk about some grounding moments. There have been some new things in the news related to the wizarding world and the genre in general that we feel we would be remiss if we didn't touch on before we started talking about mental health in the wizarding world. Um, and then we're going to go into having the conversation. Laura's going to ask us some questions, and we're going to give some answers. Again, reminding you all, like, it's just the three of us, so it's not going to be a comprehensive thing, and we'd love for you all. I'm sure you saw this and got excited about Oh, bibliotherapy. I love that. I think of this. So please, we look forward to having those conversations with y'all as well. And then the closing, that's when we'll have those conversations. So the elephant in the room, right? Mm -hmm. um, again, we can't start a conversation about mental health in the wizarding world without addressing the comments by the author that have been going on right now. And so we want to make sure that we're aware of, that we sit with the tension of both of those things, the love for the wizarding world and our belief in the inherent dignity and respect for all human beings and their ability to recognize themselves as who they are. And um, a lot of people I've heard and talked to felt a connection to the wizarding world because in a number of ways they felt othered, they felt like they didn't fit into a specific mold or type that society felt that they needed to be. Um, and feeling that sense of belonging and in the wizarding world, sitting in their rooms reading it, coming to places like this and finding community, um, or communities in other ways, chat boards, meetups in your local town, and then to have kind of a loss and betrayal um, with some hate speech that's been written. So um, we want to make sure we're, we're talking about grappling with sitting with the tension of both the love for the content and the disdain for what's being said by the author. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that before we jumped in. Um, and another acknowledgement. It uh, won't be all disclaimers. <laughs> yes. Last disclaimer. So this idea, so I'm a um, educator by trade and particularly working with equity in education. I was the um, equity administrator at a large school district in Florida for many years and for obvious reasons have left that work, um, but still in doing work related to equity in education. And this phrase, a discourse of invisibility, is used when you're thinking about the lack of representation in curriculum. But we thought it's also um, very true for the series. If any of you were in the session before this, I think they really covered that. Um, so we were so excited. I think whoever um, did the scheduling yeah, was really thinking, doing, putting but us back to back. A whole session on just the discourse of invisibility in um, Harry Potter. I think you actually could have an entire convention about just that. <laughs> Um, so we want to just say, this isn't going to be about that, but we recognize right away there's little representation of black and brown characters. When we do encounter them, they have stereotypical names or their families have stereoty stereotypical archetypes um, or maybe they're like dropped in sprinkles of limes throughout. There's a lack of Jewish representation unless you consider stereoty stereotypical archetypes in the series. There's no LGBTQ plus representation unless you count the pink washing after the fact of Dumbledore. There's no representation of disabilities whatsoever. <sighs> and um, there is no representation of mental health issues. And so that specific discourse of invisibility is what we're focusing on today. Yes. Awesome. Um, and so then, I, we said one more, but this is the very last one. You can't <laughs> diagnose a fictional character. I, you can find them on the Googles if you want to. People love to do it. But as a mental health professional, again, not licensed in Illinois or England or Scotland, um, I, I just want to let you know, like, we're going to talk about some diagnoses and we're going to talk about some different things. But again, like, you can't diagnose a fictional character. So just something else to keep in mind. All right. So let's get into it. Uh, that was a lot of what we're not going to do. Let's talk about what we are going to do. We're going to talk about mental health in the wizarding world because mental health is so important. So um, we are aware of the mental health struggles that these characters have. We are provided with lots of descriptions of what they're going through. And the books are written very specifically to give us all of this context about all of the complexities that make these characters so unique and important to us. And that's why we identify with them. But, you know, we our struggles in the real life, in the real world, might not be so overt. But it does create a space where we can examine some of the things that we're going through and use 
those likenesses to process some of our own feelings, but there's no therapy in the wizarding world. So um, that's why we're gonna kind of get into this and talk about the fact that there's not and maybe how some people could have benefited from that, but also just some of the things that we see in the representation there. So Meg, one of the um, earliest and most obvious examples of mental health I think we can all agree on is the imposter syndrome that so many of our characters face. So can you tell us more about what that even is? Yes, so this is kind of a newer thing that a lot of people are talking about, but also not new at all. Um, and I think the, um, the, there are a lot of influx of reports of it based on the fact that we're all seeing e what each other is doing in social media. So now that we're aware more of what other people are doing, we're like, oh, well, that person's amazing, and here's why I'm not. And that's mm -hmm. that, some of those um, common thinking errors that we participate in. And this one, of course, think about very first when um, they're out in the middle of the ocean and... Um, Hagrid knocks the door down and says, you're a wizard, Harry. And he goes, me, I, I can't be a wizard. I'm just Harry, just mm -hmm. Harry. And that starts right there and continues on for a very long time where he continues to say, um, I can't do, I can't be this. I'm not, I didn't grow up with this. Um, and that's definitely something that we talk about um, ongoing for, for Harry. Um, I, we were talking about this morning, kind of the first time where he really starts to think like, now I can do this is what, like in the fifth book where he's like, I gotta go take care of this on my own. And they recognize like, we're gonna do it together. And um, right. so that's definitely one. Um, and then, oh, and you're gonna do Hermione. Well, and I would say just the tone shift in the fifth book, it's, mm -hmm. you know, the, right. co the cover's literally blue, right? He yes. really takes the whole tone shift as a character in that mm -hmm. book and just to mm -hmm. see how that has affected him throughout. But. Um, we could also talk about Hermione. I think Harry is a very obvious example, but Hermione's got a lot going on with, even as the brilliant, best in her class, you know, mm -hmm. witch that she is, she struggles with a lot as well. Well, with Hermione, I want to bring one line out of this definition up where it says, people's ex or, so people are afraid not to meet other people's expectations, mm -hmm. seek validation for their achievements, and doubt their own abilities. Now, as a black girl who read Hermione as a black girl, like that, that imposter syndrome is so, so real in Hermione. Every single action that she does through the entire series, if you read her as a black chick or as a muggle, or as a muggle trying to be a wizard, she is trying so hard to prove to everyone that she belongs. And she does that through trying to be academically excellent. Um, and there's all these ways in which she's just like kind of tiny, tiny crushes on her spirit throughout. Um, and I think even for me, maybe the, it kind of starts to go away when she punches Malfoy, maybe, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> one of the, the great <laughs> moments of the, of the genre. Right. And I just really think about like how Hermione tries so hard to overcompensate, um, when they call her an insufferable know-it-all, mm -hmm. like the reaction mm -hmm. to that. Okay. I'm trying to be the super smart person, still not being accepted. Malfoy, call, Malfoy calling her a mudblood. So no matter what I do, no matter how smart and brilliant I am, I'm still going to be seen as someone that does not belong. Um, and I could keep going on and on about that, but I think however you read Hermione, you can really see her as like a perfect example of imposter syndrome playing out over the course of um, the series. Perfect. And we're going to break our own format a little bit because we are going to speak about all of your favorite main characters as we go through different mental health representation within the book. But does anybody want to speak on it? Do you have any other observances of imposter syndrome? We can make it a little bit more conversational as we go because I see some nodding and I'd love to hear, you know, your thoughts as you're, we're talking about these characters or we can obviously keep trucking on. But feel, please feel free to raise your hand and we can make this more of a dialogue. But make sure you speak up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Um, he's coming off as this little bad, and he's coming um. off as, you know, larger than life in the ugly world, but he doesn't really convince me that he's who he he's says he is. Out at. Yes. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Uh huh. Right. Let's. Like at the end, he's trying right. to try backpedal a little bit. He's not real sure he's who right. he is, mm -hmm. but he wants to be. Mm -hmm. Now, once his uh, child starts to be threatened, things start to take a little right. bit of a different light for him, right? Absolutely. I feel like I hate Lucius so much um, that I'm a little mad at you for making me feel bad for him. <laughs> <laughs> it's so but, hard to humanize <laughs> them. It does make me feel better. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry about that. <laughs> yep. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. Absolutely. I think you see a little bit of his 
before he's a fully realized kind of villain for a few books, right? In the beginning when he's trying to befriend Harry Potter to get Harry Potter into right. Slytherin, I think you see just a little bit of his human side and then like that rejection. What does that mm -hmm. do and how does that set the tone for where they go from there? Mm. Right. Um, mm. Awesome. Yes. I would say starting in book three, Hagrid. Ooh. Oh, yes. Well, absolutely. He keeps asking, how am I doing? Like, how do you all think I'm doing? Excellent, mm. Professor. Yes. Absolutely. I think that's great. great. Yeah. I, I hadn't thought like, of that. We hadn't even discussed how, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And you really, you do see that. And it's over. And she writes in that way, right? That's, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. He never gets any help. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. Ron very much has a middle child syndrome, even though he's not really the middle child. Ah. Yes, because we let's let's jump into Ron. Excellent segue. Hey, thank, thank you for so the much, segue Mary into. Um, so we talked about Harry and we talked about Hermione, and, and it would be easy to see definitely some places where Ron just does not feel as you know much like he belongs. Um, so how do we discuss Ron, and what do we does it go beyond the imposter syndrome? Mm, yes, and so. Ron specifically in this, we talk about that, right? Like middle, middle child, but not really because there are so many of them. Right. And the acknowledgement that there are multiple times even when the Horcrux is open and they say like, your mom really wanted a girl and that's why they kept having children. And uh, oh. It's got a break in the table right there. <laughs> um, and where he's got the hand-me-down robes and which by the way, if I could sidebar, the heck, the, Professor, uh, McGonagall makes fun of his dress robes, but does not transfigure them for him. Like, may I help you with these frills? Like, okay. Or Molly knows how to knit, but didn't do anything to like, I'm sure she's some sort of a sewist. Anyway, that's just my thoughts. But <laughs> so much of his stuff was a hand-me-down. You see in his robes that they're too short. They are not p pitch black. They are, uh, they have patches in them. Um, and that the Weasleys, though, I will sit up here and argue with everybody about how much I love Molly Weasley, but acknowledging she's a human and she's got very rarely is any one thing all one thing, she puts her money where her pride is. And when mm -hmm. Percy becomes a prefect, he gets an owl and he gets a new this and that and whatever. And um, of course, a lot of the attention goes to George and Fred right. because of their antics, which we love. Um, and you know, all of those things. And of course, Jenny not being able to have hand-me-downs because she doesn't have an older sister right. and all of that. And so. Um, that's something that we talk about, even especially in the fourth book, he's like, yeah, that's me, Harry Potter's stupid friend. Mm -hmm. um, and so acknowledging that low self-esteem piece that he has, perhaps even looking at it as an imposter syndrome sometimes when he is coupled with Harry Potter, right. uh, the great Harry Potter, and I'm just Ron Weasley. Um, I think even in the way, like, we know the whole time him and Hermione, like, like each other mm -hmm. and how he has no idea mm -hmm. and is convinced that the only person she could like is uh, Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he um, does get very insecure about that multiple yeah. times. So well, that. that's that same Horcrux moment as well. But, right. Um, I would also add Neville has really low self-worth. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a lot of it comes from his grandmother constantly telling him that he's not as amazing as his parents were. Mm -hmm. uh, then you have all the ways that Snape terrorizes him across the series. Yes. Um, and so he just really very much has low self-worth. And I think I liked what you did last time. So I want to ask you all who you would add or what you would add to what we said. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's interesting that we really just talked about Ron and Neville. And another thing that they Right. Right. Uh, and My dad's wand. Yes. My great uncle, whatever's wand. Yes, absolutely. And I think mm. they never, at the beginning, they never got the opportunity to be chosen. Right. You know, they didn't get to have that experience. Mm. And I think that really goes into that. They yes. Just, I mean, eventually, right, Ron's wand breaks in, in the car crash, and Neville's wand gets destroyed at the, at the ministry. And so they do eventually get new wands, but having the beginning you're 11 years old and you don't get to have that mm -hmm. moment. I think that really, really sits in them even if they don't know that that's why. Uh, thank you for that. And I wanted to add that just made me think of something else too, is that Ron broke his wand in the beginning of the second book with the car crash. And he had new ones but why? <laughs> the same thing that the same thing that I just talked about. Again, I love Molly and Arthur Weasley. I love them. They 
put their money where their pride is. And what happened? He and Harry saved Ginny in the Chamber of Secrets, and then he gets a new wand. And again, I love the Weasleys, but just talking about acknowledging yeah. the way that certain things can be interpreted and viewed by the behaviors of the people around us who love us, he had to go through the whole term, both terms with that spellotaped taped wand, which ended up saving them from Gilderoy Lockhart. But right. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There's so a, in the, have you listened to the Potterless podcast? Yes. He talks about that, and there was one thing that just blew my mind, where you think about the idea that the wand chooses the wizard, and because they don't ever get chosen, they're never actually going to be as powerful as they could be yes. until they get that wand. So you're already predispositioned by these family structures to feel low worth, and now on top of it, your magic is just going to be subpar, so mm -hmm. you finally get your own wand. Like yes. through the actual laws of magic. Yeah. <laughs> um, anybody else on imposter syndrome? Yeah. Or low self worth. Mm. That's a great example. Yes. Right. That is, that is spectacular. That is wonderful. <laughs> and, and a great transition into we, just a couple more things on Neville. So. Neville, we definitely see the low self-worth, but what we see and what we're going to move into in the next slide, you know, it's kind of a combination for him of where does that low self-worth come from and what is he processing at the same time? Because with Neville, he's also dealing with a lot of loss and his grandmother comes right. down pretty hard on him and then we've right. got, you know, we've got the howler and we've got all of that. And so <laughs> Neville, unfortunately, we see throughout the beginning of the series until he gets his glow up that uh, he's really like silently managing all of that. But what is so impressive and inspiring about him is how he uses it to make himself better as he constantly kind of fails, whether it's in mm -hmm. his own opinion or yeah. otherwise. So, you know, I think that's that perception that everybody has of us and how it impacts the way that we are is 100% a very important observation in this. Um, so moving into complex grief, grief staying on our kind of Obviously, Neville's grief is going to be very complex. His parents are still alive, but nobody really talks about the sacrifice that they made and versus the attention that Harry Potter's parents get and all of the attention, the boy who lived. And we find out more towards the end, right? right. So we're all set up for that. But um, you can also see a similar management in the silent, silently managing of your grief and kind of using it as your motivator, obviously, in our most obvious character for complex grief, which mm. is... Severus Snape. Severus Snape. Yes. Boom. And so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he really is pretty terrible. I'm not a Snape fan. Yeah. If you were here for the last session, there was a lot of, uh, we weren't really sure where to land on Snape. Because we had some real, like, there is no redemption arc versus, like, well, there's some. <laughs> well, Everything. very rarely is any one thing all one thing. I need to yeah. get that tattooed across my forehead because I say it so much. Um, but it's interesting when we're talking about the Potterless podcast and that Mike Schubert really despises Severus Snape. Think about the time when Hermione comes with the big, Beautiful. elongated teeth, like, oh my gosh, help me, help me. And he goes, I see no difference. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine? I mean, like, literally a teacher bullying a child and other situations like that where he put into, um, poison Neville's toad and all right. of the different things like that. So, um, so he is a very storied character because he starts out as a Death Eater. We know, we know all of his past in that situation. We acknowledge the trauma that he inflicts upon the students mm. and also recognizing that utilizing his grief to turn into a different space so he he decides to come back to Dumbledore to come to the Order of the Phoenix right. because he wants to try to save uh, Lily and of course that we know spoiler alert we know that doesn't work but then utilizing that you know his Patronus changes and it continues to change after all this time always um, as a result of that and one of the things that we talk about in grief or other mood disorders or stressors is utilizing that for good. So the example that I like to use, I specialize in perinatal mental health, and the example that we like to use um, is talking about concerns about like dropping your baby when you walk down the stairs. And that's utilizing anxiety for a good thing if you're able to use that anxiety and say, I'm gonna be very careful holding my baby as I walk right. down the stairs. The issue becomes maladaptive when you stop taking the stairs because you are so afraid to do so. And so that's the, the kind of, and that's a spectrum, but that's the delineation there between the one and the other. And we're recognizing here that Snape, instead of freezing and making different choices, was able then to turn that in a way that helped him to help in the ultimate end to help defeat Voldemort. I, yeah. 
Would you, um, I think one of the, di I know you don't want to diagnose people, <laughs> but you use the phrase uh, persistent complex bereavement disorder. Yes, so in the DSM-5 text revision, that is the official diagnosis now of a complex grief, but I don't diagnose fictional characters, <laughs> but that is what it is called now. <gasps> persistent complex bereavement disorder, as opposed to like, okay. previously it had been lumped under major depression disorder or whatever, but the difference between bereavement and the other things that, symptoms that cause different diagnoses. Right. All right, so persistent and complex grief. Let's talk about Harry's mirror of Erised. So we'd be remiss to not talk about our main character and the way that he <laughs> deals with his grief throughout the course of all seven books. Mm -hmm. So um, what are your thoughts on Harry? Yes, and I love, I love this motivation too because he shows up he meets Ron. He has right. no idea from Adam who right. these people are. Are we allowed to use that expression anymore? I don't know the origin of that. I don't know. We'll I, dig into that later. I apologize if that was an <laughs> offensive. I don't know the origin of that. I shouldn't use it. Um, but so he doesn't know who this person is. He seems friendly and charming. A wonderful thank you sandwich. Let's share the trolley witch treats. Um, of course, Ron tells him there's not a witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin, which we love the Slytherins. We're in our, our second house is Slytherin. So, um, so recognizing he could have taken the information about his parents and run off to the muggle world and never never come i'm not dealing with that that's y'all's problem right. good luck he could have shown up and been like voldemort that guy that guy sounds cool like he killed my parents but i like this idea like right right and instead he decided to utilize his loss and his grief in a way that was meaningful to be supportive of the rest of the wizarding world and to, to to, what is the word that I'm looking for? Not to cherish, but to, um, to uphold the loss and to make honor meaning. the, to make some, meaning, to make some meaning, sorry, my language is escaping me, but making some meaning of the loss of his parents and their sacrifice because they stood for that. Right. Um, and so Malfoy comes up and I think, I imagine, uh, this is my side note, I think Lucius was like, Harry Potter's gonna get there, you gotta get him. Right. You gotta, he's gonna come onto our side, right? Uh, and, and he says, I think I can find tell the wrong sort for myself and yeah, make that choice. Yeah. I think I'd also add Dumbledore mm -hmm. as a character mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. uses grief. Um, yeah. He could have continued down the path with, um, just lost his name, with Bay, yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, after losing Ariana, uh, turns away from all of that. Um, I also think about Neville, same thing. His parents are still alive, but for all intents and in purposes of having parents, they are not mm -hmm. um, there for him. And so these are two characters who mm -hmm. could have just gone down a different path uh, and used that grief to actually do good for the wizarding world. And I think the only thing I would say about the Snape thing, because I'm not Team Snape, um, I'm just not, I can't be, uh, is- After all this time? After all this time. <laughs> Always. So he, um, yes, he uses his grief for good, but I also think there's part of the way that he like tortures children. Yes. That isn't really like acknowledging um, or dealing with no, the, he's his grief. Absolutely utilizing, like he's expressing his negative emotion right. in a maladaptive way, <laughs> yeah. to yeah. say the very least. <laughs> um, is there anything we miss thinking about grief? Severus, Harry, Dumbledore, Neville, any other ideas out there? Yeah. Mm. Yes, oh, Petunia. Yeah. Mm. Uh huh. That's right. And having that constant re reminder, even though they weren't, they didn't end things on the best of terms. There is still a loss when a significant member of your family is gone, right. and to have to have that constant reminder of why he's in your house. That I would be curious to to learn a little more if we could ever have like a small extra paragraph or whatever that might look right. like of what was that a driving factor for her because she just couldn't stand to see him mm. and so let me get him out of my sight as well as obviously we know Vernon just doesn't like him because he doesn't like their kind which is you know pejorative but yeah so the Great. audience wants us to feel bad for villains today thank you yes <laughs> the villain support group. very <laughs> rarely is any one thing all one thing yeah yeah, yeah. anybody else on complex grief yeah, yeah. please Oh, oh, yeah. oh, I know you can't see it, but that's the bottom half of my costume. Is my, the top yeah. half is a big there. Luna fan. Yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Thank you, man. Yes. That's beautiful. You're missing the coat. Yeah. My coat and stuff. My well, specs are over there. What would you say about Luna? Besides, obviously, she has a lot to navigate through. Right. 
Right. Yeah, mm-hmm. but the moment that she tells Harry the about the Thestrals, it, yes, mm-hmm. just your yes. whole perception of her character becomes much more complex. Mm. And she's actually a character, if you hit the googs, they'll tell you a lot of diagnoses that they think that they have for her. And I don't think, I think if she has anything, she has some sort of complex bereavement, but mm. she certainly doesn't have any sort of psychoses. She's just fun and whimsical and likes to look at things in a different way. And people like to be so prescriptive of giving her, oh, right. she's loony. She's, and I don't like to use the word crazy, but she's crazy. And it's like, no, she's different than you. Be curious, not judgmental. Go away. Uh, right? That's a really good example. Love it. Great. Thank you. <laughs> yes. See, this is what we were talking about. Like, we had some conversations, but we are not everybody. So we really appreciate y'all joining in. Well, and it helps to look at all of the different ways that characters, mm-hmm. as we do, process things. It's yes. really the whole point of all of this is these are not real life examples, but they are real things that do happen to real people mm-hmm. in real life and mm-hmm. to illustrate mm-hmm. the way that people process things and kind of identify with that can help us process our own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we can, we can come back to complex grief because it hits so many of the characters, but one thing we want to talk about kind of on that same topic is we, we talk about Snape, love him or hate him, we talk about Neville, we talk about a lot of these characters um, as using their grief and kind of the overcoming of it all or the redemption arc in the books, and those seem to be the characters that we really focus on from like, oh wow, look what they got past, but there is also a thing that happens when you've got characters with a very complex past, and we're going to get to uh, the Malfoys now, um, and what happens when somebody decides to go a different direction in processing all of that? What happens when they don't become hairy and come assign some meaning to their feelings, or, um, you know, they go just down a different path? So, um, we, let's talk about Draco. We're talking about the Malfoys. We, I believe we would all be led to believe that family is fairly narcissistic. I mean, <laughs> JK wasn't hiding it when she named his mama Narcissa. So it's it's out there on the page for all of us to be told exactly how we're supposed to be feeling about that family. But, right. you know, and I'm sure on the Googs that they diagnose Draco with narcissistic personality disorder. They I sure do. Looked at it, but I would make a guess. So <laughs> yes, they sure do. What do you think about Draco and his narcissism? Well, I love the idea, again, like the armchair quarterback, that's not what it is, armchair expert, Monday morning quarterback. There we are, <laughs> there we are, don't conflate those. Or could, the armchair quarterback, there you go, um, does see that from the, like, you know, the looking at narcissism in a way of, it's my world, you're just living in it, people right. are pawns that are here to, to uh, help me or not, whatever. But instead, I think, I really do see it more as the external pressure that has come down. It's been handed down to him generation after generation after generation. Mm-hmm. We know Narcissa, Narcissa, I'd say that every time, Narcissa, Narcissa, Narcissima. and Bellatrix <laughs> being related, their family coming from the purebred line, mm-hmm. the Malfoy, all of that name and what goes with it and the expectations. And it's, I think it's the external pressures that he has. Um, he's a spoiled, privileged person, and his vantage point is that. He is judgmental, not curious. He absolutely has that privilege, that vantage point to look through his entire life. Um, and that is where I see more of him putting on those airs, not because he has some sort of internal personality, but because he has these external expectations. And this is why education is so important, not from a, like, can you recite the history of magic text, but from the way that we are able to open our minds, again, being curious and mm-hmm. being open to understanding different things, um, using critical thinking, operating in nuance. Yes, this person comes from a muggle world. What do they have to offer? What can I learn from them instead of going from the opposite direction of go away from? I don't even like to say mud blood. I don't. It makes Ugh. it hurts me. I, I don't feel like, like to it's say real, it. It is a real slur. I, I really do. <laughs> I, I know we use it because it's not, anyway. Um, and so being able to operate in nuance is so important. Um, choosing to take in new information, choosing to be uh, intentional about recognizing those things, or in this case, just passing on these learned behaviors. You will do this because this is what is expected. You will marry this person, etc. And so narcissism is rooted in shame. And we understand that shame, you know, that's the armor that we build up to protect ourselves from other people. And so we point at other people as you are worse than I am because look how amazing I am. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's something it helps to protect from vulnerability. And so that I think is what we're looking at more so than a narcissistic personality disorder for Draco. Hmm. What about Bellatrix? Okay, so she might have some psychosis. <laughs> Again, I'm not licensed in England, but <laughs> yeah, she, yeah. she, she, she Yes. Yeah. Yes. I I know you don't want to diagnose people, but Voldemort. 
Also, again, I think that's another thing where he really does like a, a Machiavelli in the ends justify oh. the means. Um, you're, it's my world. You are living right. in it. You are welcome to live into it if you fit these expectations. And if not, your life means nothing right. to anyone, not just him. He believes that there's no value. There's no mm. inherent dignity of a person who doesn't fit those qualities. So, I mean, yeah, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, could. Is narcissistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, thinking through that, are there any other examples in the series for you? And not necessarily just in whether it's narcissism, but that shame, that armor of shame and the vulnerability and the struggles that we have to express. I, honestly, I don't want to get too much into it yet because we're going to talk about it, but it really applies to our world now. I feel like a lot of times, especially with social media, which has so many great things, that we struggle to say, I don't know, or mm -hmm. I'm going to change my mind based on new information. Um, we kind of feel like we were born with this information, we were taught it, it was passed down, as we talked about with the Malfoys, and that's what I'm sticking with instead of being open-minded to looking at other things and viewing right. other aspects and letting people live their lives in the way that's the most meaningful for them, because it really doesn't impact you. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts on narcissistic characters? Yeah. <gasps> yes! I'm not a giant, how, da how very dare you? And her having to ha conceal that piece of her, of her identity, because of the expectations and right. the, the societal structures. Absolutely. Mm. Very good. We hadn't thought about that either. Love it. Adam <laughs> Maxine, you're really bringing in the, I like it. Yes. Yeah. Reaching into yes. the canon. Oh! oh. That is some narcissism. Yes, there. I mean, <laughs> shame that he is a Ravenclaw. But, but it makes sense, though, right? Because he is deeply intelligent. Jeez. He is not skilled. And so he's able to manipulate the situation to work for him and to the point that he even is willing to obliviate children, 12-year-olds. Mm. Absolutely. Love it. Oh, that's a good example. Well, we don't love it. We don't love <laughs> no, I love you all for bringing it up. I don't love the situation. <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, I think Draco is more, well, I think we all know he's complex, but I think we spend a lot of time talking about some of the other characters, the richer characters that we like, we like a little bit more, let's be honest, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. a lot of time diagnosing Draco, but definitely, he's, he deals with a lot, I mean, look at his internal struggle when he was told to go and kill Dumbledore, mm -hmm, and how they handled mm -hmm, that for him, and, right. and all of that, so his expectations and the pressure that, to your point, just to bring it out in home, it makes him a more unique character than I think sometimes he gets credit for, but lots of layers. Yeah, right. and we see Nuance. this. We see this same, you know, struggle. Honestly, if we break the original canon a little bit, we see a little bit of that struggle with Dumbledore as we get into the Fantastic Beast world, mm -hmm. and we learn more about to your point where he could have gone with Bay and like right. just kind of some of the, <laughs> some of the things that he um, he struggled with. So. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we talked a lot about Dumbledore today. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so we can analyze these topics to death, obviously. We're just giving a few examples of specific mental health topics. But um, really, the ultimate thing is we can see what can happen if we don't acknowledge and try to discuss and right. um, kind of address in the best way that we can our mental health concerns. So we don't live in a magical universe here. Um, but we can still acknowledge the own magic that we all have. I know it's cheesy. I'm sorry, but it was a... <laughs> the way to really kind of bring it together. So we don't want to focus on fixing ourselves because we're mm -hmm. not going to get fixed. Mm -hmm. But we can talk about, like I said, having the conversations, being open, taking lessons, and really trying to look through the material at ways that we can find some observances and improve our own situation. So um, Meg, maybe walk us through a few of the things that we can do to not suppress our own magic in the real world. Yes, so if you all will indulge, because based on different panels I've been on, some people only like to stick to the seven book canon, some people are willing to step outside. We're gonna just step hop outside, over. Dear. Hop over to Fantastic Beasts for a moment, <laughs> if, they'll, if you'll allow. Um, and talking about when we suppress our emotions, what happens. We know what happens with Credence when he suppresses his actual magic. And we talk here about our emotional magic, and that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Because then it becomes an obscurus, which for us, think about the many maladaptive skills that we use or the opportunities where we suppress. And one of the you know, cliches that we use in therapy is like, if you keep sweeping things under the rug, eventually someone's going to trip. And that obscurus is our tripping, right? What are we going to do in a way that's meaningful for us to find a space where we feel supported, that we can be vulnerable and express, I don't have to know everything all the time. I can talk about this. I'm allowed to feel and not have shame related to feeling because we're humans, but I, we have been told a lot, um, those messages that you have to suppress. And so I love the obscurus as 
the representation of that from the Fantastic Beasts and Credence, right. um, and ta referencing uh, Harry Potter therapy, an unauthorized self-help book from the restricted section by Dr. Janina Scarlett. She talks about um, when others feel threatened in our lives by our emotional magic. And so then we hide that and we stifle it away because we want people to feel comfortable around us and instead being able to recognize like living our authentic self in a meaningful way where even if it makes somebody else uncomfortable, we're living our authentic lives. And that's something that we're looking toward this whole conversation. How are we more intentional about living our lives in a meaningful way, being honest and true to our own self, our hierarchy of values, do my actions, lead to support my hierarchy of values? If yes, let's go. If not, let's reassess. Let's have that conversation. Can I add to with the um, suppressing emotions? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reading Ariana as an obscurus. Yes, absolutely. Because yeah, I think even what hap eventually what happened to Dumbledore's sister is based in the fact that she was suppressing emotions. Yes that eventually impacted her magic. Yes. Once, once you're watching Fantastic Beasts, I think you, at least for me, you better understand mm -hmm. what happened with his sister. Yes. So in that way, it is canon, right? That like this idea of suppressing your emotions can mm -hmm. literally blow up mm -hmm. and yes. hurt the people around you. Yes, so, yeah. and uh, Laura mentioned it already, but I, when I get new clients or family members who bring in, you know, I used to work with adolescents or, and young children, and people would ask like how I can fix their child, mm. and the word fix in therapy is such a taboo word. You don't need to be fixed. Um, it, it's, we even talk about like if you're familiar with Enneagrams, which I'm not gonna get into, that is a whole hour conversation. Mm -hmm. But it's not talking about the things that are wrong with you, it's recognizing the motivation behind the things that you do, and where can we then use that in an intentional way this is what drives me, this is what motivates me, how can I make things that make more sense in my life and make them in a more adaptive way? I don't need to fix, I don't need to change. I mean, people can change if they want to change, but changing is... <laughs> and Alexa's gonna tell us all about it. Oh my, okay. Um, but you don't need to be fixed. Right. And I think that's the thing that we need to work on internalizing as well. When you have the identifying with houses up there, how does that to you relate to this? Well, I think this is another one too, right? And I know it is not canon to be a griffin claw, puff, door, whatever, but that's fine because we love it and you do whatever makes you happy. <laughs> but I would say I'm a slither claw, right? And, um, and so whatever, being able to identify with houses um, and recognizing the traits, again, there, there are lovely Slytherins, right? Like there are wonderful people, things about being a Hufflepuff and being a Ravenclaw and there's nothing wrong with any of that. We like to, people make jokes about Ravenclaws being nerds, I'm a Ravenclaw, like being the nerds, which I certainly am and I'm happy to be, and like, that can be a bad thing in some people's eyes. For me, I utilize that in a way that's helpful, or like, sometimes I'll call myself very anal, but like, I em em embrace that in a way that is helpful and motivational for me, and then recognizing ways, like, I'm stressing myself out in this way, in this tra trait and characteristic, let me try to find a way to adapt to that more appropriately. So that's the same thing with identifying with what your house might be and recognizing there's no right or wrong or bad or good. So that identifying with the house helps you, it's like the opposite of suppressing your magic. Mm -hmm. By actually identifying with something, it's helping you be a better wizard or witch. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. The, like recognizing it. those traits. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't have to <laughs> I think for me, the one that I have up here is code switching. Um, if you're not familiar with what that phrase means, um, as a black woman who works in corporate America, there's ways I have to show up at like a uh, staff meeting that are very different than how we were on the rooftop bar last night. <laughs> <laughs> and I think uh, women are probably familiar with the ways you have to shift how you talk in certain situations. Um, even how we might talk to parents is gonna switch. Uh, but really thinking about, is this code switching serving you or harming you? And I think it, for me, is a really good example of suppressing your magic because it diminishes mm. who you are a mm. little bit. Um, but I think back to what you were saying about actually acknowledging, if I'm at least acknowledging that my magic is being suppressed by kind of changing how I act. Yes. Maybe, um, I, don't, I don't know that I can not code switch in right. that situation, but at least being aware and acknowledging it might lead to my soul not slowly dying yes. <laughs> well. when I'm doing that. But I think code switching is definitely a way that uh, we suppress our magic like mm -hmm. every day. Mm. Oh, well, that again, though, the self awareness piece. Right. 
Yeah. There are certain situations where you do, the expectation is there and we can't, though we would like to cha make changes in the world, we can't change them overnight and we mm -hmm. can do the best that we can in our situations and also not get fired or right. not whatever that might be. And so at least being self-aware, making sure that you're being intentional, that's the word of the day is being intentional, right? Like being intentional about the choices that you do make and understanding how that supports, again, your hierarchy of values and suppressing, uh, suppressing supporting the situation. Well, let's bring it back. Okay, so amazing topics, and we're going to open it to questions next, but like to bring it back to the materials, since that's what really led this conversation. Mm -hmm. We were talking earlier about Hermione, right? Book one, early on Hermione, she yes. is dealing with her imposter syndrome by right. really kind of like overcompensating, even though she knows she's brilliant and she's very talented, and right. that goes without saying, And she, but she doesn't see the ways in which she could embrace other sides of herself and right. let people see other sides of herself, and once... She unfortunately gets a little bit of feedback that was unsolicited, right? right. Mm -hmm. But she takes that and really, I don't want to say it does work, because she didn't have to change. Mm -hmm. right. But she saw the things she wanted and she recognized her own behavior and kind of found a way to get into a better space that gave her more of what she was looking for. Right. Mm -hmm. So just always being able to be self-aware and do that work. And it's not that you have to change. You don't have to code switch. Right. But if you're trying to get to a certain point, like being able to recognize that and do the things that are going to make you happy mm -hmm. and recognizing what that happiness looks like. I think um, the way to put that question out to the group uh, is so we are, we're trying to look at the books, take lessons from how we operate in our own lives, particularly about suppressing our own magic. Mm -hmm. So for you all, how do you take lessons uh, from the characters uh, and how you improve your own situations? You have to put the or next have, slide up though. Yeah, you got to show us our That's the perfect, our yes. There you go. Oh, <laughs> so, so the first thing is a question for you all, and then you can ask us some questions, but how have you used the books to try to improve your own situations or how have they impacted you? Um, whether, I think, if possible, thinking through the mental health conversation or just other ways in general. Any prior to today? Or like, oh, I see that in myself. <laughs> yeah. Or any questions or other topics that you, while we were talking, you're like, oh, I thought about this. Go ahead, yeah. please. Right. Right. Well, and it gives people a common language too, so that if you're able to talk about the things that are upsetting in the book or the things that start start a conversation, it's a new way to a new language. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Go ahead, please. Um, my mom has dementia. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's powerful. Mm. Wow. Yes. Please. I'm not sure if this is related, but it absolutely it's, it's is. Related. Let's go. Yes. I know I don't know where I can park at the thing next to it called the drug guy and look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, but so that's that's a really good example though I love that going back to this tripping with your baby on the stairs. Like deciding, recognizing that I've got anxiety and I'm going to go and scope it out ahead of time to set myself up for success versus I'm so nervous I'm just not going to go, right? And those are the two different mm -hmm. levels that you look at. And I also, just, if anybody's familiar with Glennon Doyle, she has a podcast, and just this past week they talked about like, they're an Irish family and their thing is speeches and they, that's like their gift to each other is writing this beautiful speech. But 
they went to this surprise party for their parents and did, she, Glennon didn't prepare a speech and her dad was surprised so he didn't get to prepare a speech. And people externally were able to say, you seem so happy and calm and in the moment because instead of sitting there being like, okay, I'm gonna say these things and I'm gonna think and da 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 da, they were enjoying the moment and then just got up and spoke from the heart. And then her dad was able to give more specific examples that were again, they weren't as guarded and protected because it was in the moment versus I wouldn't have written about that. And so be it, that's a really good episode of a podcast, should y'all wanna listen to it? But otherwise, being able to say, like, how much do we prepare to try to find control in mm. something and how much of that can be maladaptive and how much of that uh, yeah Hermione went and showed up and got perfect marks so it's not a bad thing and also where can she unclench a little and find the relationship with Ron and Harry and not constantly have her nose in the book thank you so much that absolutely absolutely does reminds me even of this (laughs) 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 like preparing for leaky con you have no idea what the room's gonna look like who's gonna show up and then if we're sitting here talking about mental health and we're not therapists, people are like, what are y'all doing? <laughs> um, but luckily we have a therapist on the panel. But just in everything you described, literally, I was like, oh my gosh, it feels like me yesterday. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I feel seen. Yes. <laughs> Any other thoughts, comments, questions? Something that has nothing to do with the topic, but you just really want to share it in a public space? We're here for that, too. <laughs> All right. Well, we really appreciate you all coming out. It's been such a, it's been a stress, but a good one. We're very excited to have the opportunity um, to share our thoughts, and we really appreciate you all interacting with us during the panel. Um, this is how you can find us. I'm MegDukeLCSW.com, Amplify Wellness with Meg on Instagram. I also host the Perinatal Podcast. Um, I would love to, if you all have any more questions or you want to interact, I'd love to have the opportunity um, to chat with you more. Florida, Missouri, Kansas, Texas, Washington, Indiana, Iowa, New Mexico. Okay. Thank you, and I also have a coaching practice that is not licensed, so I can do it anywhere in the world. But those are my little therapy states. You can. <laughs> um, also, I, like I said, I am not a therapist. I'm Laura Browning. I'm actually a, I'm in sales, so it's uh, <laughs> totally. I mean, you can come find me, but my Instagram hasn't had a post in like four years. So I'm really bad at that. Um, and we just like to put up causes, so uh, I just I, and I'm a big fan of the Trevor Project. That's what I always try to donate to. And when Meg and I do our podcast, that's what I always plug at the end. Um, and I am an educator by trade. I also do a lot of contracting with museums, nonprofits. Uh, it's the it's a very long random list of things that I do. But you can find me at Vin- InvincibleSummerEnterprises.net. Um, or follow my travels and adventures on Adventure in Wine on Instagram. Just got back from Alaska. Yes, she did. Really great content on there about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate Thank it. You Thank you. We did it. So quiet. We need more of your. Yeah, I was gonna say, can you put your music back 